We're talking about in our New Testament challenge, we're over halfway through in the reading, and I know God is working in your hearts, but we're talking about the challenge of forgiveness. And this is something we harp on a lot, but it's so, so huge. And let me just share with you a story to start this out. It says, it's two days before Christmas, and a young man named Tommy Pagogi, what a name, was at a party getting drunk. When he left the party, he decided to drive. And as he was driving, he blacked out, and while he was at the wheel, he hit 18-year-old Ted Morris head-on, killing the only child of Frank and Elizabeth Morris. Recalls Elizabeth Morris, I intended to hate the man forever. When Elizabeth and her husband first saw Tommy in court, the devout Christians were surprised at the intensity of their hatred. Says Elizabeth, Tommy was walking and breathing. And my son was dead. And it was so unfair. I wanted him dead too. When Tommy pleaded not guilty, their resentment deepened. Tommy was charged with murder, but the charge was reduced to manslaughter. He was only required to spend every other weekend in jail and participate in Mothers Against Drunk Driving programs for high school students. Elizabeth went herself to go hear Tommy talk at a Mothers Against Drunk Driving program with the intention of confronting him. But she wasn't prepared for what she heard. I thought he would be excusing himself, but instead he talked about the anguish he felt. He even called himself murderer. After that, Elizabeth went to see Tommy in jail. My son's life has been destroyed, she said, but it seemed Tommy could still be helped. In an extraordinary act of forgiveness, the couple befriended the man who killed their only son. Tommy began to go to the Morris' church and spend every Wednesday and Sunday with them. He even became a follower of Jesus and was baptized. Ted, Elizabeth said, my son, would have wanted it this way. He would not have wanted us to go on hating. The hatred was eating at me like cancer. Now I can be happy and really live again. That is an incredible story of forgiveness, but it's a, it's a story, and, and, and forgiveness is something that's so huge uh, in our lives, and, and getting a grip on it and understanding how important it is, from understanding what God's forgiveness is and to how we can forgive others is so crucial um, in our lives and so important to those of us who have chosen to follow Jesus. Now, it's so hard to forgive. I mean, it really, really is. Like, when people have wounded us, it is so hard, but it is absolutely necessary If you are going to grow and live the life that God intends for you, we cannot hold on to unforgiveness. It's it's, it's God's plan for us, and if we want to experience his plan, his blessing, we've got to forgive. Look on your notes from your bulletin, the first verse at the top of the outline, Matthew 18, 22. The apostle, or the disciple Peter, one of Jesus' 12 disciples, he came up um, to Jesus one day, and he he was pretty pleased with himself. He thought he had come up with a great idea. And he said, Peter came up to him and said, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? And in Peter's culture, what he was about to say was pretty radical. He's like, seven times. What about that, Jesus? Should I forgive him up to seven times? Peter was totally expecting Jesus to go like, wow, Peter, that's, I'm impressed. That's really good. You, you, man, you're going to forgive him seven times. Man, I'm gonna, when, I, when I go back to heaven, I'm going to reserve a place next to me for you because you're doing so great. But Peter looks at it. I mean, Jesus looks at him and tells him and responds, and, you know, like he often does. No, Jesus replied, 70 times seven. For those of you good at math, that's 490 times, but that's not the point. It's not that we should just forgive 490 times and cut people off. Is that Peter, Jesus is trying to tell Peter that, that yes, yeah, seven times, that's fine. 490 times, it's, it's limitless. Forgiveness is intended to be limitless. It, it, it's, it's something that, it's a life that God wants us to live. And if you think it's hard to forgive, I understand, because it, it, it's almost humanly impossible for us to be able to learn to, to really truly forgive and let go to others. It's something that God has to do um, in us. And so some misconceptions about forgiveness, it's here on your outline, and what, this is kind of like what forgiveness is not, some quick fill-ins here. Number one thing, is you, as you look at forgiveness, it's not about justifying um, the other person's actions. When you, when you choose to forgive, and we're gonna talk about how you can do that, it's not justifying their actions. It's not saying it's okay what they did. It's not, it's not saying that, hey, what you did was fine. Um, it's not that you were right and I'm wrong and that I should have never you know, been mad at you or whatever. That's not what it is. It's not, it's not saying maybe what they did was wrong, and it probably was, and it still will be. That, but forgiveness is not justifying their action. It's not waiting on the passage of time. You know, some people say, you know, time heals all wounds, and time sometimes helps. But here's the deal about time. Time is indeed a great magnifier. Um, and we think, oh, if I just give it time, and yeah, it's, 
it's going to, it's got to have time. But the thing is, if you don't forgive, time is going to magnify your hurt. You're going to grow more bitter and more bitter and more bitter and more bitter, and that wall is just going to grow and grow and grow, and it becomes even harder to forgive. So it's not about waiting on time. Forgiveness is not about waiting on the passage of time. Forgiveness is not denying that you're hurt. Because what some people do to us sometimes, it really does hurt. And it's not saying that that's not real and that that's just going to go away. I mean, it's a reality. It's not saying that. It's not confronting them personally. Um, A lot of times that's what we want to do. We want to go and and get at them. But forgiveness is not always that. Forgiveness is something that we do. It's not really about them. It's about what's going on in us. And last, it's not about trusting them again automatically. Sometimes we we confuse forgiveness with trust. Uh, And just because we forgive them doesn't mean that we automatically have to put ourselves back in that situation um, where we're trusting them to to harm us again. Trust is going to have to be built over time, but forgiveness should be automatic. So that's what it's not. But let's look at what, as we've been reading in the New Testament, you've been seeing these scriptures and, and, and just what the, the scriptures tell us about um, how we can forgive others. What, here's five steps to forgiveness. And I'm, I'm going to be shooting at you with like a, with a fire hydrant kind of mentality here. So just be ready, strap on, you know, put on your seatbelts. And I'm going to be flying today. Um, forgiveness, number one, um, is remembering how much I have been forgiven. It is almost impossible perhaps impossible, for you to forgive others until you know what God has forgiven you, until you've actually received God's forgiveness. And when you understand what he has done for you, then, then that's going to enable you and give you the ability um, to forgive others. We've got to experience his forgiveness. Um, what sin does, and we've talked about this, is we, sin builds a wall between us and others. And God, God, we have like, you might look at our relationships, we have, um, this is our horizontal plane here. Like, I have relationships with you, my family, coworkers, you know, whatever, neighbors. And then we have a vertical relationship with God. And sin enters in our life, and unforgiveness is sin. Um, and, and that we just put, like, bricks, and we're just starting to build walls and barriers between people, and, and us and people, and us and God. And sin hinders that relationship with God. And, and unforgiveness is a part of that. And if we continue to refuse to forgive people, we are hindering our ability to connect with God. That's why Jesus connects, you know, the two greatest commandments. He said, or love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's the vertical, and love your neighbor as yourself. You can't be having this going on good if this isn't going on good. And if this isn't going on good, then this isn't going on good. It's a both and. You've got to, you, we've got to learn to get along. We've got to learn how to love one another well, and part of that is forgiveness. Um, and and the, the thing is that going back to, like, our sin affects others, but it's, it, it affects our relationship with God. And that's what we were talking about. That's why the gospel had to, that's why Jesus had to come is because my sin separates me from God. It, it creates a wedge, it creates a division. God is holy and he can't be with sin. And my sin will separate me from God from eternity if I don't receive a remedy for that sin. And the great thing about our, our loving God that made us and created us and, and loves us so dearly is that he doesn't hold grudges. And that he's willing to let go and he's willing to forgive. And he went so far as to send his own son to die for my sin and take care of my sin. Look at the the next verse in your outline, Colossians 2, uh, 13 and 14. It says, he has forgiven all your sins. He has utterly wiped out the evidence of broken commandments, which always hung over our heads, and has completely annulled it by nailing it to the cross. Christ bore our sins on the cross. We we carry that weight around. You know, I love that that, that imagery there. You know, the, the, the evidence of broken commandments. We've broken God's way, and it hangs over us. You know, it's like a shadow, you know, and it's just this cloud, darkness over us. And God wants us to be set free in, 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 into his light, and he's done that for us. But we've got to receive um, that in. Some people think, you know, they look at us as Christians, and, we, and this is our own fault sometimes. They see our hypocrisy or whatever, and they think, oh, well, you think you're better than me, or you think you, you know everything. No, I don't. The distinguishing factor of being a follower of Jesus is that I'm forgiven. That's all it is is that I know God's forgiveness. That's what sets us apart as believers, is that we are forgiven. And the question is, and that's why I started earlier with it, is have you been forgiven? Have you received Christ into your life? Some people, they grow up in church, and they think it's kind of like by default. Like they went through all the programs, their parents are Christians and deacons or pastors or whatever, and they may even have walked the aisle and been baptized, but they've never really asked Jesus into their heart. They've never really repented and turned to God and said, God, forgive me. But I, don't, I, I want you to know his forgiveness. And wherever you are today, I hope that you will receive him in your life. And, it, and, and one way that you can do that, and, and if it helps, and that's why it's here, is just to say, you know what, I need, I need a little accountability. Mike, there's something going on in my life. I need, I need to know that I, I know Jesus. I want to trust him in my life. I want to, I want to do something. 
like just make a response to him, recommit my life to Jesus. Jesus, you know what? You know, I, I understand the gospel. I'm, it's Jesus in my place. It's, I'm in him, and I want to recommit to him today. What is God doing in your heart? How do you need to respond um, in, in knowing how much he has forgiven you and that you would say yes to him? Because when, you have, when you've received that into your life, when you have truly received Jesus into your heart, forgiving others almost becomes natural. I don't even have to explain it to you because you're so grateful for the debt that he's paid for you. It's like, why would I not forgive anybody else? Look at all that Jesus has done for me. So we're, we've forgiven. First John 1, 9 on your outline says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just um, to forgive us and to cleanse us from every wrong. God does not want to withhold unforgiveness from us. He wants to deliver us from our sin. He, he is so, so willing to forgive. That's, that's, that's who our God is. Uh, the next one in your outline, not only do we remember how much we've been forgiven, but we need to reflect, and this is steps towards forgiving others, remember. Start with, remember how much God has forgiven me, but then it's reflect on who I need to forgive. Who do you need to forgive? It probably won't take you long to already, because God, God's already at work, um, and he's going to tell you this is who's in your life that I need to let go of. I need to give them, I need to stop, I need to let go of the power that I'm giving them in my life. Because when we, we think we have power over people when we don't forgive them, we think I am not going to forgive that person. They don't deserve my forgiveness and I'm going to hold this over them. They're not worried about that. You're, you're putting yourself, and we're going to talk a lot about this, in your own um, prison, ultimately. You're giving them power over you. And God wants you to be set free. He wants to give you forgiveness. So think about who is it in my life that I need to forgive. The verse on your outline there, uh, Matthew chapter 5, verses 25 and 26, Jesus says, come to terms quickly with your enemy before it is too late and you are dragged into court, handed over to an officer and thrown in jail. I assure you that you won't be free again until you have paid the last penny. The point of Jesus' story there is to make things right with people as soon as possible. You need to figure, who do I need to forgive and how can I do that now? And I want to challenge you, just take your, uh, your, uh, your outline, and I want you to think about who that person is that you need forgiveness, that you need to let go of, that you're giving them power, and you're imprisoning yourself, and write their initials somewhere on your sermon outline. You know, and don't be looking over and thinking, okay, well, who's that person? You know, so I'm not having you write their names, you know. Just let it be between them and God. But who is it that you need to forgive? And say, you know what, I'm going to, God, and maybe just start this prayer while I'm talking. Like, you're not ready. This is who it is. And I'm not ready to forgive them yet. I know I need to. So God, help me through these steps to get to that point um, where I can forgive. So who, who is it? Write their name down on the outline. And, uh, and, and as you think about forgiving them, sometimes we want to say, well, I just, I forgive so-and-so. And that's good. That's a good start. But I want to challenge you to be specific and to talk it out, you know, in your own heart. Talk it out before God and say, God, this is how they harm me. God, I forgive them for this, not just in general. God, they hurt me. This is what's going on. And God, I'm going to get to the point where, God, I'm, I'm going to let it all go. Next verse in your outline, Psalm 139. I love this scripture. Um, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. It's a prayer to invite God's presence in your life, just like the, the Spirit of God is like a flashlight in the dark places of your heart, just to go, you know, what are you hiding in there? What's in those dark places that you don't let God into, that you've, you've locked God out of, and you say, God, that's this person, it's this unforgiveness. Show me what that is, and I invite you into there. Number three, on, or it's not numbered, but the next one in your outline is release the other person. Um, we, re, we, we, we figure out who it is, we reflect on it, we, and we say, you know what, I'm going to release that other person. We're going to set them free. I know with me, when somebody wounds me, you know, I go back and I'm constantly just building a case against them in my mind. Look, look at what they did to me. Here's, here's the record of wrongs of what they've done, and I've never really released them. And God says, I want you to let them go. I want you to let them free. The biggest problem in, in doing that is often our own ego. It's our own pride that says, you know what? I am not going to humble myself and let go of this. I, I, and our ego gets in the way, and ego will destroy you. If your pride will kill you. I love this statement. The world is full of people who would rather be right than to be happy. So many people, like, I refuse to forgive somebody, and it's making me miserable, and I'm locking myself in my own prison, but I am not going to give in, and I am not going to let go, and I am not going to be happy. And they will go to their grave feeling that way because of their ego, and it will destroy them. So God wants you to release them. 
I, l- I love this next passage in Matthew 18. Uh, it says, um, th- this king had forgiven this man an incredible debt. And, and you might as well say it was a billion dollars. If you read the scripture and understand what he's talking about, this guy comes in, he owes a billion dollar debt. Anybody in here have the ability to pay off a billion dollars? There's not many people on the planet that could do that, all right? The, the king could have taken his life, thrown him into prison, he lets him go. Uh, but then the man, after he's freed, goes out and finds his, his friend, his fellow servant, who owes him like 10 bucks. And he says, you, no, you, you can't pay me. You're going to prison until you can pay that debt. He just got forgiven a billion, and he's holding this guy to 10. He, you know, that just doesn't make sense. So here's what the king says in response. The king called in the man he had forgiven and said, you evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I have mercy on you? The angry king sent the man to prison until he had paid every, every penny. That's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters in your heart. I, lo- I love the imagery here is that forgiveness is a prison that we choose to lock ourselves in. And we go, at, un- un- I say unforgiveness should be. You know, when I choose to not forgive someone, I am taking you know, that, that prison door and I am slamming it shut on myself and I am closing myself off to that person. I'm closing myself off to God and God cannot work. I am hindering his work in my life and I'm the only, but the cool thing, the amazing thing about this is, I'm locked in my own prison of unforgiveness, but I hold the key. It's not like there's a jailer out there that's got to come and let me, set me free. I'm the one that's holding on to it. And I can just reach through the bars, you know, and put the, the key in there and open the door and let myself out. But I'm choosing to stay in, or you're choosing to stay in. So we've got to learn to release the other person. We've got to set ourselves free and set them free, and that's, that's how it is. We forgive them. We let them go. It's like, I'm not going to hold on to this anymore. God, you've forgiven me so much. So how do we release somebody? There's some quick fill-ins there. Um, releasing someone means to forgive instantly. There's no, like, waiting period. It's not like, okay, I'm going to, you know, I've got to give it a day, a week, a month, a year. It's just, it's just instant. God, you've forgiven me. I'm going to forgive others. Boom. God isn't have a waiting period for you, so he doesn't want us to have it for others. Number, letter, uh, the next one, forgive completely. Forgive completely. We don't hold on to any part of it. We just, we get specific about it, and then in general, and just say, God, it, it, it's theirs. I'm, I'm letting this person go. It's complete, and it's total. You've forgiven me everything. I'm forgiving them everything. Letter, the, the next one, forgive freely. Forgive freely. I love, here's the catch with forgiving people freely. The catch is, there is no catch. What we like to do is we like to have like an if-then statement with our forgiveness. If they come to me and apologize, begging and pleading, then I will forgive them. If, you know, they'll go and, and, and make restitution and do whatever, and we, we have all this stuff, we have all these qualifications. If they do that, then I'll forgive. And Jesus says, no, it's not about that. Forgiveness is not about them. It's about you letting go. It doesn't have to do anything with them. Forgiveness is totally on you. It's totally on you. Letter, so forgive freely, letter D, or the next one, forgive repeatedly. Forgive repeatedly. That's what, you know, Jesus talking about 70 times 7. God doesn't put any limits on his forgiveness of us. Thank God he doesn't stop forgiving me. Thank God that the gospel says that I am in Jesus because of what he has done for me and not on my ability to maintain it. He forgives me limitlessly. Thank God. So I have to go out and be like God and forgive others. And once we do that, as we learn to release, the next fill-in is reestablish the relationship. But so key here is those little parenthetical words there, as much as possible. That God, as we forgive somebody in our hearts, that we reestablish a relationship as much as it's possible. Because not every relationship can be reestablished. I'd love for it. I think that's a, that's a great picture of what the kingdom of God is supposed to look like, is that we forgive and we get reconciled. But that's not always dependent on us. And sometimes it's not even wise because sometimes the wounds are so severe and so deep is that it's just not good for you to be in relationship with that person. And, and, and sometimes they're wounded and, and they're angry and they're hurt. And it's just not like as much as you would want to, it's just they're not, they're not ready, they're not there, and it's just not a good idea to pursue it. You just need you gotta let it go. But when we can, the encouragement is to go and reestablish the relationship where it's possible, as much as it's possible. Romans 12, 18 says, do your part to live in peace with everyone as much as possible. And I think some translation says, as far as it depends on you. In other words, you leave the door open. You know, I, I can't go and, and re- reconcile with this person uh, because of their bitterness and their anger and their hurt. 
But if they ever get over that and they're willing to grow and forgive and, and to let go, then, then we can do that. So you leave the door open. But if the door is open, you be willing to walk through it and say, you know what, I will forgive, I will restore the relationship, and I, I will reconcile. But the thing about reconciliation, that's a two-way street. Forgiveness is one way. It's you to them. But reconciliation has to do with both of you. So you can only do, you know, what you can. And last but not least is recognize God's purpose um, in the process. That God is at work in your life. And, and learning to forgive and let go of, of, of the wounds that we have and to let go of people and to set ourselves free to do that is to recognize that God is at work in our lives and we're hindering him if we're not trusting him with forgiveness. He wants to make some changes. The, the, the verse um, there on your outline, Romans 12, 19, dear friends, never avenge yourselves. Leave that to God for it is written, I will take vengeance. I will repay those who deserve it, says the Lord. We have to give that person over to God and trust him with them. Pray for those who have wounded you. That's a distinctive of Christianity. We, we, we love when people, when people curse us, we bless them. When people hate us, we love them. We pray for them. We say, God, I want, I'm, I'm going to let this person go, but I'm going to put them in your hands. I'm not going to repay evil, evil for evil. I'm going to pray for them. I'm going to let you be the one. You take care of it, God. You convict them in their heart. And whatever you do, God, I trust you, but I'm going to let this thing go. Second, Corinthians 3.17, I love this. It says, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. When you've locked yourself into the prison of unforgiveness, you are not free. And God's spirit is not free to work in your life because you're locked in. But when you open, when you reach around and unlock that door with that key, you're letting the spirit of the Lord back in your life and he will set you free and then you can go and live freely. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. God calls us to live um, in that freedom. You hold the keys. Who do you need to forgive today?